Welcome everyone. We're so glad you could join us for this webinar exploring the pandemic's impact on churches and what our data shows thus far. The findings that we will explore in this event are from a five-year study that was launched in 2021 called Exploring the Pandemic Impact on Congregations. This study is uh, led by the Hartford Institute for Religion Research at Hartford International University for Religion and Peace. Hartford International University, HIU for short, changed its name from Hartford Seminary in 2021. And we are a pioneering interreligious international university with degree programs, leadership certificates, and educational opportunities for professionals of all kinds. And before we go any further, we'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge the Lilly Endowment, which has generously funded this study, making this important research possible. And just to offer a closer look before we get uh, any farther here at who we are, our research team on this project is comprised of six core staff members at the moment, um, as showcased on this slide, five of whom you will hear from this evening. Dr. Scott Thoma serves as our principal investigator. Dr. Allison Norton serves as our co-investigator. I myself am Sarah Brown, the project director, and we have three excellent postdoctoral and doctoral research fellows working with the project as well. Dr. Andrew Gardner, Hannah Evans, and Carissa McCoskey. And in addition to the faces that you see here, we also have an extensive network of contracted consultants across the country who support our project in a myriad of ways, from writing to research and everything in between. And as a brief overview of what to expect during this event, um, following this welcome and overview of the project, you'll hear from Dr. Andrew Gardner, who will set the stage for uh, or by drawing parallels between the congregational responses to the 1918 influenza pandemic and the current COVID-19 pandemic. Thereafter, Dr. Scott Thuma will provide a high level summary of the state of the church during the pandemic thus far, followed by Hannah Evans, who will offer a closer look at trends in religious education from our most recent topical survey of the study. Next, Dr. Allison Norton will reflect on some of the bigger picture implications of what this data means for churches and their leadership. And we will close our presentation portion with two clergy reflections, one from Dr. Rachel Lawrence, an ordained pastor in the American Baptist Churches USA and senior editor of Judson Press. And uh, the second from Reverend Anna Tu, a Lutheran pastor currently serving a congregation in South Hadley, Massachusetts. And for the final half hour, we will then welcome your questions and do our best to answer them. So just to offer um, a, a zoomed out view of what we are doing with this study, um, as this slide demonstrates, our project is multifaceted with a mixed methods approach staggered across a five year period, beginning in 2021 and running through 2026. And the three primary components are, um, number one, our national survey efforts conducted in partnership with our Faith Communities Today partners. And Faith Communities Today is a collaborative research initiative that has been conducting surveys on congregational life for over two decades now. The second piece is a longitudinal panel, which is designed to survey a consistent group of 280 churches annually and track change and innovations that may occur in their settings across five years. And the third component is a regional qualitative piece with research teams in eight cities across the country who are conducting case studies of 96 churches um, this year in 2022, and then again in 2024. And interwoven throughout all three of those components, we are also collaborating with a wide network of organizations across the religious landscape in an effort to synchronize many of our data collection efforts and ensure that our study is as broadly representative as possible. And this slide just quickly offers a visual representation of those regional research sites that I mentioned for the qualitative portion of our study that is now underway. 
And as you can see, we've endeavored to capture both urban and rural settings and the variety of impacts that have been felt from coast to coast. And to just briefly demonstrate the collaborative nature of our project, um, this slide captures our current seminary organizational and initiative partners. And uh, here you can see on the left-hand side, this slide showcases our regional research partners with whom we're contracting to conduct field work on the ground in the aforementioned cities. And on the right-hand side, you'll see a list of affiliations of our advisory council members. Our 16 member advisory council is comprised of experts in the sociology of religion, um, practical theologians and congregational practitioners that provide guidance and shape the research that we're producing. And finally, this slide provides a sense of the denominational partners that are working with us through the Faith Communities Today initiative to survey their congregations. And the first three surveys that we have completed thus far, which my colleagues will go into greater depth about shortly, um, were conducted in collaboration with the denominations listed here, along with a national random sample. And the last thing I'll mention before I turn things over to my colleague Andrew is a housekeeping note about questions. Uh, please ask them in the Q&A section, which is visible in Zoom near the bottom of your screen. And we will answer them during the final half hour of the event. So Andrew, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, let me get my screen up. All right, let's see. Can everyone see that? There we go. Uh, all right. Uh, so it is my contention that a spoonful of history helps the data go down. So we're starting this evening uh, with a little bit of history. Uh, and part of that was intentional on the part of our project that when we were conceptualizing this, uh, the early stages of this project, we thought about the importance of contextualizing uh, this period of time in American religious history for congregations. Uh, and, we, and we wanted to look back at history to see any other parallels that might be helpful for us as we conceptualize the questions that we should be asking uh, as we you know, think about the types of resources that congregants uh, and congregations and congregational leaders might need. Uh, we wanted to have a grasp of how pandemics have affected congregations in the past. Uh, and the pandemic of 1918 uh, provides a helpful parallel uh, for us in our current moment. Uh, and so a little bit about the pandemic of 1918. Uh, it is also it is known as kind of the forgotten pandemic, uh, that it uh, ended uh, with uh, the end of World War I and was kind of uh, forgotten in collective memory. Uh, some historians will suggest it killed as many as 100 million people globally. Uh, and uh, as many as uh, 600,000 uh, people in the United States. And uh, a lot of news organizations have really kind of covered over the past two years, uh, some of this history more generally, uh, but haven't looked as much specifically as how congregations were uh, engaging with uh, the 1918 influenza pandemic. And in many ways they were interacting with this pandemic in much the way that we interacted with the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and so to start off, uh, with some of these parallels start off, I think uh, helpful is, is to look at mask and masking and different ways in which churches sought to protect their congregants and sought to institute public health orders and follow public health orders uh, as, as different cities were shutting down across the United States. Uh, influenza affected different cities kind of through waves uh, as we have experienced with uh, the coronavirus and the, uh, they experienced this in the fall of 1918 and into the spring Spring. So mask orders uh, in 1918 were not always compulsory, um, but doctors argued, quote, all persons going to church without protection are endangering the lives not only of themselves, but of all others in attendance. Uh, these are doctors quoted from a, a newspaper in Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, in that same uh, kind of article, the doctors encourage members to wear germ-proof gauzes over their mouths and nostrils. Uh, you see a couple, here's a, a photo or a kind of a, a drawing from uh, a, a newspaper in Denver. Uh, 
uh, and I believe this other clip about keeping windows open is from a, a, a newspaper in Chicago. Uh, the Seattle Post Intelligencer uh, highlighted the importance of masks with a particularly uh, short, funny poem that I really like that uh, they wrote, mother had a fetching mask without a trace of rust. She's painted on a little sign. It says in gauze, we trust. And so churches really kind of used uh, masking as a way to protect their congregants. They kept windows open to keep uh, well-ventilated uh, sanctuaries. Uh, in Spokane, Washington, after a uh, period of uh, six-week quarantine, local health edicts uh, prohibited churches from communal singing. Uh, they allowed for solos, but they prohibited communal singing. Uh, and they also prohibited uh, um, churches from allowing people to sit in uh, pews one after another, that there had to be alternating pews roped off uh, to keep people spread apart from one another. So there was a practice of social distancing in congregations. Um, additionally, churches canceled services uh, for a very long time. But that didn't mean that church services weren't happening in the same way that churches closed their buildings during uh, the coronavirus pandemic in the early days of the coronavirus pandemic, and still some uh, have, have not yet uh, uh, opened their doors to this day, um, uh, they turned to the technology that they had, which was newspapers, to help uh, offer religious services for congregants uh, in their homes uh, and in you know, small, uh, small communities outside of the church building. Uh, and so uh, in a New Orleans paper, there was uh, a printing of a number of sermons for stay at home Sundays. Uh, and ministers often partnered together with one another to put together uh, services that would go into the local paper that would encourage Bible readings in, in the home, would encourage uh, parents to share their favorite Bible verse and explain to their children why they, they liked that verse. One of my particular favorite uh, innovations was in uh, the Indianapolis Star that they uh, published in October uh, of 1918, uh, an entire Sunday service that you see here uh, that included uh, a start for the doxology and invocation of the Lord's Prayer, hymns with the sheet music included, scriptures from the lectionary, uh, and then sermons from local ministers. They included sermons from local Episcopal, Methodist, Disciples of Christ, Presbyterian, Catholic, Baptist, and even Jewish congregations. Uh, while this included uh, Roman Catholic and, and Jewish uh, congregations, uh, the, the service was definitely skewed more towards a, a Protestant uh, liturgy uh, than uh, a liturgy from uh, Roman Catholicism or, or Judaism. Uh, but still, these papers were a way in which uh, congregants could uh, continue to go to church. And they talked about it a lot like we talk about Zoom today. Uh, that the newspaper pastors would say had the opportunity uh, uh, to reach thousands who never darken the door of a sacred edifice. Um, uh, one paper in Canada explained, quote, it has given the businessmen, the average citizen, a greater opportunity to size up preachers in general, that people could church hop uh, and they could see what other ministers were preaching, what other ministers uh, thought like and, and, and what they kind of preached on and kind of choose perhaps which uh, church they might attend following uh, lockdown. Um, and, uh, and it gave congregants the opportunity to, you know, attend multiple services from their home in their pajamas while they ate breakfast in much the same way that we think about that today. This was the logic that they used in these papers and the way they talked about it uh, in these papers. Uh, economics also took a hit within congregations, just as much of the early days of the pandemic, we were, we were all worried about uh, uh, the economy and how that would affect uh, congregations, many congregations who perhaps did not have uh, electronic giving set up today. Uh, churches in 1918 were also worried about this. Uh, and you see newspapers uh, from Long Beach to Baltimore that were talking about how churches were uh, you know, fundraising during the 1918 pandemic were worried about whether or not they'd be able to raise enough funds. Uh, Trinity Church in Long Beach uh, in, in November after their lockdown had raised enough money, perhaps going door to door to congregants to, uh, to, to provide their, their tithe uh, so that the church could have, uh, could reach its financial obligations for the month. Uh, and they had uh, a surplus that month. 
uh, as you can see in this short article. So economics were, were an important uh, issue that were all, was also factoring into the 1918 pandemic. Um, protests, uh, as, as we mentioned, you know, there was, there was mask wearing, there were also anti-mask leagues uh, in San Francisco and other uh, cities that have been reported on. Uh, congregants and, congr and, and ministers also protests, uh, protested quite a bit during the 1918 pandemic. Uh, one uh, Episcopal clergyman in Philadelphia wrote, it is inconsistent to close churches and yet, and let yet allow people to crowd into bars and stores on the plea that businesses, business must go on, end quote. Uh, that is probably a quote you could have probably heard in the early days uh, of our pandemic uh, as, as lockdowns were enforced. Uh, this question that bars and other stores and alcohol could be sold, uh, but churches couldn't meet. And this was a major sticking point for a lot of ministers. Uh, most only protested via the newspaper and via, you know, their sermons and texts. Um, in Ohio, however, the Reverend George Cox of um, a Methodist church uh, actually uh, hosted a, a service against lockdown orders and was arrested, along with 16 members of his congregation who were meeting uh, against public health orders. Uh, they were sent to jail and uh, upon being put into jail, the minister uh, rose from his prison cell window uh, to about 500 people who had gathered to hear him preach a sermon. Uh, and uh, in that sermon, uh, he spouted off conspiracy theories about Masonic orders uh, who were too friendly with the saloon crowd that were, you know, causing these lockdowns and not allowing churches to meet. Uh, and I, I don't need to, to remind you of, of all the parallels you can hear in that to 1918, um, to, to today, but in 1918, this was happening. You can't make some of this stuff up. Um, uh, and there is a lot of emphasis on uh, healthy mindedness. And so the term mental health had not yet become uh, a popular term uh, used in 1918, but the religion of healthy mindedness was something that you see in, in some of these sermons that, that ministers were really emphasizing. Uh, particularly uh, here is uh, a sermon from uh, Dr. E.W. Bishop uh, in uh, uh, Michigan. Uh, where, where he wrote, religion of healthy mindedness uh, does not rest entirely on God, but requires individuals take responsibility for their own health. Uh, he encouraged uh, his readers um, to focus on three goals, attending to their physical hygiene, their mental poise, uh, and through the holding up of a spiritual goal that he said. He, uh, he wrote that people suffer not only from imaginary diseases, but also from diseases of the imagination. Worry is rusting some people out more than work. Uh, you can hear that as, as, as much as uh, congregations really struggled in, in 2020 and even to this day about, you know, how do they get back uh, into, uh, you know, meeting regularly with people. There was also great emphasis on mental health uh, and mental health among, you know, not only adults, but, you know, we hear today a lot of mental health about uh, youth and children that weren't able to attend school. And so these were also issues that congregations were facing with in 1918. And so this is just a little bit of a taste of some of these parallels that help us think about the similarities between uh, 1918 and the present, that help us think about what are the questions that we should be asking about this particular historical moment that are questions that we didn't get asked uh, in, uh, in 1918, that we have newspaper articles that can, that can give us insight into that, but we don't yet have the data uh, from 1918 to really see how congregations were responding, uh, you know, what percentage of, of churches were really protesting, what percentage of churches were really engaging in these, these newspaper uh, services. And so our project really hopes to look at that, those questions as they, uh, as we can, you know, search them to, today through surveys and, and through the data that we're collecting. And so uh, with that, uh, I, will, I will suspend my history and turn it over uh, to Scott. Uh, who will share a little bit about the uh, kind of the overall view of where churches are right now in the pandemic. Thank you very much, sir. That was quite excellent. Let me get started here. All right. So as Andrew said, when we when we looked at 1918, uh, we really didn't find a lot of data. And so this this project is really uh, about trying to collect that and not have that happen again when we have the next pandemic. 
And as Sarah said, we have um, we began this, in fact, with with a Faith Communities Today survey um, that happened right at the very beginning, uh, prior to the pandemic, and and right at the very beginning. So we we've set a baseline uh, with uh, fifteen thousand surveys of pre-pandemic, and then in in the pandemic survey and, and research itself, we've we've done three surveys so far in the summer of last year, in the winter of last year, and then in the spring of this year. And in, in each case, essentially what we found uh, was an average size of a congregation of about 65 people in attendance. And I, I start with this because I think, especially even though the pandemic has affected all of us uh, at some level, um, it has affected different populations, uh, different size groups, different organizations, different regions of the country in different ways. And people have perceived it affecting them in different ways. And so there are many variables here at play, but size is a significant one. At, at this point, we have uh, about 15% of congregations having in-person worship only. We have roughly about 5% having uh, online um, worship only. And then we have about 80% of congregations that are um, actually doing hybrid worship. <clears throat> Before we start with the pandemic um, data though, I, I wanna emphasize this question of size because it's, it's really critical. Um, when we began the, the Faith Communities Today research back in 2000, the median size of a worship attendance of a congregation was 137. And, and 20 years later, um, in, in 2020, the median size is 65, which means the size of congregations has, has chopped in half in 20 years. Not only that, uh, essentially, we have uh, an incongruency between the number of congregations and where most of the people are. The, the vast majority, about 70% of the people who attend each week, are found in just the top 10% of congregations, which means that there are many, many very small congregations with relatively few people, and roughly 35,000 with the vast majority of people. That, that plays a very important role in looking at the pandemic. So, so now more toward the pandemic data. Uh, currently, on average, congregations in, in our country are roughly about 12% below where they were in 2019 in terms of attendance. But this isn't true equally across, across the board. Uh, about 38% of them grew, but almost half of them are, are below the pandemic, uh, pre-pandemic level. And, and in many cases, that's significantly below. And that average attendance includes both in-person and also those that are online. As, as I said, about 80% are hybrid. Uh, as, as of pre-Omicron, we had about 90% of churches having someone test positive, 40% um, of staff, and 28% and had at least one person die of the virus, which if we extrapolate from that is roughly 250,000. A good many clergy encouraged people to get the vaccine, but only 8% served as testing or vaccination sites. And Though we heard a lot about conflict over mask wearing and closures and such, um, relatively few had any serious conflict, as you can see on the screen. Now, during the pandemic, there, there was a significant rise in the demand for services, uh, people uh, needing more money, needing food, needing spiritual guidance and such. Uh, it, it really grew. Uh, and congregations responded. Over 50% of congregations said that they either added new ministries or increased their current ministries. Uh, and, and you can see that mostly it's distributed across the, the activities that a, that a congregation would do 
in any case. Unfortunately, what also happened during the pandemic is that the level of volunteering declined significantly. In, in the 2020 Faith Communities Today survey, we asked and 44% of, or, and church pastors said that 44% of their regular attenders usually volunteer. When we surveyed them in the summer and then in the winter, that number was 15%, and it has climbed now to 20%, but still uh, half of what it once was. Financially, congregations are doing fairly well during the pandemic. The uh, median income actually rose, uh, but with our last survey, it has come back to what it was uh, prior to the pandemic. And, and this is taking into account the PPP loans as well. Some congregations had increased giving, but a good many had decreased as well. Um, and a, a large number, thir almost a third said that they have some financial uh, viability issues now. And almost 20% said that they have some continued existence threatened because of this. However, optimism isn't completely on the wane. If you, if you notice some of these questions that we've asked, uh, how, how churches are feeling about what, uh, how they're experiencing the pandemic, we, we see a little bit of decline in, in some of the figures, but at the same time, um, congregations are looking to new, for new ways of uh, doing what they're doing. And, and here, um, I think this, the point that I, that I started with, size does make a significant adaptive difference. Uh, when we asked uh, the churches, did they have the resources to pursue the new opportunities uh, that, that arose because of the pandemic? You, you can see that depending on the size of the, con of the congregation, uh, you get a significantly different response. Uh, congregations of each size uh, are absolutely trying to find all of the ways they can uh, to do what they need to do. But um, unfortunately, the larger the congregation, the, the more uh, resources they have. Not only that, uh, smaller congregations tend to be the ones that uh, are most threatened um, by the pandemic. But remember, we said almost 20% uh, uh, agree that their church's continued existence is threatened. Uh, but if a congregation is under 50 attendees, that rises to 24%. And, and that's a significant number because there are quite a few congregations uh, that size. Uh, those congregations of 51 to 100, it's 17%. It drops down to 9%. Uh, for those 100 to 250, and then a congregation over 250, only 4% of those congregations say that um, their existence might, might be threatened. Oh, sorry. Um, so as, as you can see uh, from, from this little snippet of data that we've given you, uh, we, have, we have much, much more, but um, there, there are some real challenges for, for smaller congregations. And, and one of the, the challenges is, as, as you recall, there was quite an inequity between size and where people are, where the resources are. And uh, the pandemic seems to uh, maybe, uh, one of the outcomes might be uh, the continued exacerbation of, of some of that, of that challenge. Uh, there, there are all sorts of implications that Allison will pick up on uh, as we go forward. But next, I, I'd like to pass it over to Hannah to, to talk about our spring survey that looked at uh, religious education. So take it away, Hannah. It's not my share. Sorry. Great, thanks, Scott. Let me share my screen. So Scott talked a little bit about some of the general trends 
I'm going to break them down just a little bit by age group in particular, um, and in particular, the ways that faith formation was shaped by the pandemic. Um, so here I have a couple graphs that are very similar to what Scott had shared before about average numbers. Um, I have them broken out also by um, denominational tradition, loosely speaking. Um, so Catholic and Orthodox, the historical mainline and evangelical. Um, you'll see that across the age groups, um, adult, child, and youth, uh, the trend is generally the same, um, except for adult here, you'll see kind of an interesting different pattern. Um, and this kind of shows up overall as we look at the different traditions um, is that evangelical saw the least amount of disruption during the pandemic when it came to religious education than the other uh, denominations did. So this is for religious ed specifically, I should say, not just general church attendance. So this was religious education. Um, we asked a question about uh, plans for VBS. So um, in the most recent wave three topical survey, this was in March of 2022. Um, we asked people whether or not they typically offered VBS before the pandemic. You see this pre-pandemic VBS question category here. And then did they offer VBS in 2020? Did they offer it in 2021? And at that point, were they planning to offer it summer of 2022? Um, so that was that question was about their plans, but you can see there's a really interesting um, trajectory difference here in regards to whether or not people were planning to offer uh, VBS. You can also see that in particular evangelicals um, have adopted a different approach to bouncing back from the pandemic than the other traditions here. So here you see a similar pattern to what we would expect based on the VBS responses. So Catholic and Orthodox fairly split. Um, for the main line, overwhelmingly, they said that religious education was disrupted by the pandemic. And for evangelicals, the majority said that religious education was not disrupted during the pandemic. So you have some uh, traditional differences in regards to how the different um, Christian traditions in America are responding to the pandemic in terms of whether or not their programs are continuing to be offered, and, and as we'll see in a moment, how they're being offered. Um, volunteers are a big part of congregational life, depending on the tradition, but in particular, um, mainline and evangelical traditions, and you can see that they both experienced similar challenges in terms of um, finding volunteers for religious ed during the pandemic. I didn't break these out by tradition because they were pretty consistent in terms of patterns across religious traditions, but overwhelmingly churches increased use of video curriculum uh, during the pandemic, the majority anyway. So here you can see um, a breakdown based on religious tradition. The light blue, sorry, is evangelical. Um, you can see that uh, for Catholic and Orthodox and evangelical, both the majority continued to offer children programs in person. Um, mainline it was more likely to say that they didn't offer programs or that they were discontinued, uh, probably because mainline traditions in general are more likely to be older. And so they were less likely to offer the programs before the pandemic began. Um, Catholic and Orthodox traditions also have particular parts of the liturgy that require um, in-person attendance. And so they were more likely to offer in-person or in-person and online than um, the other traditions. So this is a comparison. The previous slide was children, which is zero through 12. Uh, for, uh, for youth, which is 13 through 18. Um, you can see similar patterns in regards to mostly being in person and the main line in particular, uh, mostly had discontinued or not offered compared to the other traditions. Uh, but the pattern is relatively similar to how children, uh, how programs for children were being offered. Now this is the adult religious education. And you can see here that in-person and online is much more common for adults than it was for children or youth. 
Um, in general, the feedback that we received from respondents on the topical survey number three was that they really struggled to do online programs for children and youth, whereas they had a lot more success doing it with adults. Um, and so we have reason to believe that that hybrid options for adults may be here to stay, depending on the type of program that's being offered. Children's religious education in the United States is um, more likely to be done by volunteers as opposed to pastors or staff. Similar patterns with volunteers uh, for youth. But then for adults, we see that pa the pastor is more likely to lead pastor, uh, adult religious education as opposed to children and youth. So who is running programs, particularly when people are struggling to recruit volunteers during the pandemic, may also be having an effect on whether or not those programs are being offered during the pandemic. You can see here that denomination also plays a role in um, which, uh, however, which um, type of leader is responsible for child religious education. So staff is more likely um, to be a Catholic or Orthodox rather than rather than evangelical. Youth, there, there was potentially some confusion um, in our responses about whether or not staff or pastor would be a youth pastor. If we ask this question again, we'll break it out. Um, but you can see that for youth, uh, it's a little bit more varied. And then for adult pastor is definitely the most likely response for, for that. So they were asked what has been the most successful religious education adaptation you made in response to the pandemic. Um, the most commonly responded one was virtual and technology, uh, but there were a number of different responses that people gave. Everything from, you know, DIYing curriculum and more parental involvement to an intergenerational focus of, of formation, consolidating uh, structural programs for adults and children together, increasing small groups, but overwhelmingly in, uh, expanding virtual and technology programs for spiritual formation was the most common response. And that's pretty much the majority of the trends on, uh, on adult formation, spiritual formation. I do have more broken down by congregational size as well. So if you do have questions about that, we can return to some of my slides in the back. But I wanna turn it over to Allison to get some, a chance to talk about future directions for leadership in congregations. Hi, everybody. Great to be here with you this evening, afternoon, depending on where you are. Like Hannah said, I'm just gonna talk through um, a couple of uh, sort of emerging insights and implications that we see uh, coming out of these first three surveys of what is, as Sarah shared, uh, a much larger project with money, um, uh, much more data to come. And in particular, I'm excited to see what's gonna emerge out of our case studies that we're doing in almost 100 congregations that we haven't talked about today, but we'll be um, doing more work in that analysis and starting to share some of that into next year. So thinking about uh, the changes uh, that we've seen um, over the last uh, couple of years with the pandemic, uh, it's, it's very clear that the pandemic has caused massive disruption to congregational life. And as Scott noted, it's not shared evenly by all congregations that disruption has occurred uh, and felt very different for small, smaller congregations compared to larger ones. But in either case, congregations of all sizes have really faced real risk and loss that they also alongside that have shown and given us examples of creativity, of innovation and life-giving approaches where we've seen the spirit at work leading in new directions. Um, but the disruption does exacerbate existing trends of decline and loss in congregations across the U.S., but it also has the potential to lead to metamorphosis. And indeed in parishes and congregations, Christian communities, we do see some seeds of renewal sprouting that there's a renewed interest in experimentation. There's a renewed interest in change. 
uh, there's an openness to new ways of being and doing church and digital innovation and other forms of innovation and in religious education and, and innovation in ways that we connect with our communities in terms of our social engagement and outreach. And in times like this, there's times of great social change in our nation that aren't limited only to the pandemic. Uh, this, these times really call out the dynamism, that the potential for dynamism that we see in our religious communities and traditions. So I'm gonna highlight a few um, elements that relate both to the risk and loss and also the hopeful parts that we see, the sort of hopeful aspects that we see emerging out of this data thus far. So when it comes to risks and loss, we see that many congregations have struggled to maintain connection and community with attenders. Um, that in each one of our first two surveys, we saw about the same percentage of congregations that uh, responded that they're struggling to maintain contact at about 40 percent um, of our respondents. And I think this raises questions for us of will this uh, disconnection continue? Um, since 1990, we've seen in American society a rapid uncoupling of sort of the spiritual quest from participation in religious institutions beginning with the more liturgically centered traditions. And more recently, we see the same pattern emerging in many evangelical churches. And so this pattern has been part and parcel of this growing disconnection uh, from social institutions that Americans have generally. But this has accelerated uh, some of the trends in attendance and volunteering decline that Scott has highlighted. So we know that most are at least 12% or more below 2019 levels in terms of attendance, although Scott mentioned some have grown. But this is more likely to cause sanctuaries to feel empty. This impacts lay leadership and volunteering, which is significantly down as lay leaders face realities of burnout, exhaustion, and fatigue, the same way that many pastors have experienced. So what will congregations look like uh, as there are no longer church buildings to call home and help define the boundaries of belonging? How might this erode some of the connections between congregations and denominational headquarters as we see denominational climb that's also exacerbated by the pandemic? So for both mainline and evangelicals, denominationalism is increasingly a less useful way of understanding these traditions compared to a century ago. Now individuals and congregations are much freer to move between and among, to leave denominations. And during the pandemic, we've seen people staying in their congregations. We've seen people leaving their congregations, but we've also seen people switching as they make choices on religious belonging based on convenience, based on their ideological similarities in response to the pandemic. And in the face of denominational decline, then leaders of churches, clergy, lay leaders, are carrying more of the weight of figuring out what to do in response. The weight of entrepreneurialism, the weight of innovation, the weight of change, the weight of trying to make sense of what is happening. And as some people have left through the back door or have simply logged off of Zoom, does this leave uh, for us then a sort of religious remnant, right? The sort of faithful few who are sticking it through, who, are, who have a passion for religious belonging. Um, we've seen that giving has stayed fairly steady and evidence that for at least the time being, there are still those who will continue to give, who will continue to show up uh, Sunday mornings, whether that's in person or virtual or both. And so I think this is a time for us to reflect on what it looks like to have a few of the strongly faithful committed remain and allow to see what can flourish and grow and thrive out of that into the future. Churches are also facing a very tricky balancing act. So for those churches that were strongly impacted by the pandemic, and these um, 
often were churches that uh, had an extended virtual only option um, or those who have returned to offering an in-person option only rather recently, these churches have faced a lot of challenges, have really struggled to maintain, uh, especially the numbers to sustain a hybrid reality into the future. So although now we see about 80% having both in-person and some form of virtual church, uh, is this sustainable? There's a lot of questions right now that we're raising about um, what this means for perhaps splitting already small congregations into even smaller modes of two forms of participation. But it is of, of perhaps no surprise at this stage, a couple years outside of the pandemic, um, that we have witnessed in this time the rapid adoption and authorization of virtual forms of doing church. So we've seen the embrace of digital technologies and using these in attempt to maintain connection and community. Um, and that we have seen um, this rise of the hybrid church. And yet, I, as I said, this presents some challenges, right? Of how do you sustain these vibrant hybrid ministries in ways that can move that virtual community beyond a spectator role. And this is extremely difficult, especially for very small congregations. And it raises for us further questions around what church belonging and affiliation means when we have um, attenders who join from across the nation and even across the world. And this raises questions too about, will this contribute to the further um, bifurcation of worship services? But now a couple of minutes on the more hopeful trends that we see emerging. And our first two surveys, uh, a very striking finding from the first two surveys is that there were greater percentages of congregations compared to the pre-COVID baseline. There were a greater percentage of congregations who strongly agree, agreed with things like they were striving to be diverse, that they were um, willing to change, to meet new challenges, or that they were actively involved in their local communities. This is interesting. This is something we will continue to watch throughout the next few years of our study, that these vitality measures um, were up from our, our, our pre-COVID baseline. And as Scott showed, there's been some cooling uh, on some of these points of optimism. Uh, particularly on openness to change. But what I think we see in our most recent survey is a continued pressure towards adaptation and change, a continued pressure of the pandemic uh, causing churches to, in particular, think about new ways about their future mission and dire direction. We asked that question in particular. Uh, are, are you thinking in new ways about your future mission and direction as a result of the pandemic? And we've, we've seen in this last survey, a shift away from a neutral response to an agree or strongly agree response. So for church leaders at this time, what is needed at this time? It's an embrace of the virtues of elasticity of thought and practice and innovative posture. Um, this is pivotal to American Christianity's future, especially at this particular moment. It calls on leaders to develop their capacities in communication, to make collective decisions and to imagine a common future. This becomes ever more important and essential for healthy and vibrant churches. People in pews, we know, have sometimes viewed Christianity as irrelevant to their daily needs and realities and have looked elsewhere for help. COVID has forced rapid responses to the lived experiences of trauma, financial and health needs as congregants have needed increased pastoral and practical care. Churches have largely rose to the occasion, demonstrating opportunities for increased relevance to the lived experiences of attendees. So we need to be doing church in ways that resonate with people's larger li lives and suggest that this, the decisions need to be made closer to where people live, that fine-grained ap appreciation for people's lives is essential to providing worship experiences, points of connection and care, 
social outreach in ways that resonate with the daily experiences, but also allows people to transcend their lives, to gain uh, a deeper understanding or even critique that will inspire growth and change. So I just wanna to include to say that for all the challenges that we see confronting churches in our nation because of the pandemic, we know that Christianity is an ancient, it's a varied tradition that over centuries has had flares of renewal, flares of change and innovation. And there's no reason to think that would be impossible now. So I'm gonna ask, uh, so thankful today that we have um, two of the uh, coaches in our pastoral innovation network, two clergy that are gonna reflect a few minutes further on this. And so I'm gonna invite Dr. Rachel Lawrence. Thank you, Allison, and uh, thank you to all the panelists today for sharing more data and research with us. As I was listening to the um, presentations, I found myself traveling back in time through all of the joys, the wonderful discoveries we had during the pandemic and all of the hardships. During the pandemic, I was pastoring um, Second Baptist Church in Southfield, Connecticut as a first co-pastor with Tom Carr and a then transitional pastor for the, the, pre, the last year. So um, virtually all of my experience was taking place in this, this church, this new church setting where I found myself in a role that I never expected, preaching in conditions that I never expected. I would temper, or, or I would, I would describe my initial reaction to the pandemic as having had some like tempered optimism. I found myself listening to the scripture one day really taken with this idea that if, if these people were silent, the stones would shout out. And so I found myself believing through the pandemic that even if this was the death knell of the American church, something else was going to rise up from, from God's creation to keep this message going forward. And I really, like that is what kept me going as a pastor. Um, as we went through the pandemic, um, we went primarily to virtual worship for until about May of 2021, when a critical mass of people got their vaccines and we decided to start reopening slowly, gently, and with some, um, some caught like a, a good amount of caution what was being advised by the cdc etc during the pandemic the things that we had started in order to respond to people's needs is um we spend a lot of time on the phone calling our congregants we spend a lot of time emailing we started drawing up these very long um touch points via electronic means during the week um in addition to keeping our services running um, we started online small groups, book groups, Bible studies about prison ministry and things like that. Um, and as well as meeting with small groups outside when it was determined that meeting outside was a safer venue. We, we did Lectio Divina out in our garden that way. Um, but as time went on, I do think that there was a, um, a lack of motivation that emerged in people who had typically volunteered and shown up for events. Um, people started sort of straggling, um, falling off of, of Bible studies until we started reopening. The reopening breathed some new life into the congregation for a while, but then that too became kind of tense. People started arguing over who should be masking and to what extent and um, and it's, we still never really recovered to the, to the full, um, having many volunteers for children's Sunday school or um, coming to in-person Bible or um, Sunday school for adults on Sunday morning. Um, so, you know, what, what I saw is, um, what I saw happening, in, and I think about this with Allison and the Pastoral Innovation Network, is uh, it was a wonderful moment for creativity. We had an opportunity for people who were at home, stressed, seeking meaning, seeking human connection, 
and the Christian church that was able to go online was able to deliver something. And quite frequently, people were reaching out and looking for it. So we, we've had a good moment in that. But creativity does have its risks. And one of those risks is that for the, investing the energy into the new thing, people find themselves longing for that old thing, especially those who have not grown up with developing community in virtual spaces. Um, so I want to thank you again um, for, the, for the opportunity to share about this and to reflect on the time in COVID and to, to do it with some data that says we were not alone in this experience. And I'd, I'd like to invite my friend Anna to continue. All right. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so my name is Anna Tu. I am the pastor at Our Savior's Lutheran Church in South Hadley, Massachusetts. Um, we are one of the small congregations of which we have uh, spoken this evening. Uh, we are one of those under 50 uh, average worship attendants. Uh, like Rachel's church, we did a lot of online church, especially in the beginning. Um, a lot of virtual church. Uh, eventually, we did go to outdoor worship. Uh, the summers in New England are just so nice. Um, so we were able to do that. And again, with our small numbers and masking. And then eventually, post-vaccination, we did uh, go back indoors uh, with masks. Uh, and then like many congregations, have slowly kind of taken away the requirement for uh, mask mandates. Um, and also like Rachel, I found myself sort of going back in time as the data was presented to kind of my experience as a pastor throughout uh, this pandemic, as I'm sure many of you have. Um, as a pastor here in New England, one of the things that I hear, uh, maybe not often, but not infrequently, um, is that, oh, come on, Anna, religion is just a fairy tale um, that you use to make yourself feel better. Uh, what I've noticed over the pandemic is that the only real fairy tale is that life together is simple. Um, we have discovered over this pandemic that it is very much not, and the data has borne that out, as we've seen presented this evening. Um, the pandemic only brought about what was sort of already true um, for us, that life together is hard and that it's constantly shifting beneath us um, and that decisions involving people and their health and their spiritual health are really hard. Um, so my read sort of from being a pastor through all of this um, and as we're sort of slowly coming out of it is that um, at least for my congregation and my people, and I'm noticing with my colleagues as well, obligation is gone. Um, people don't come to church anymore because they feel like they have to. Um, I think we have all, both religious, non-religious, clergy, non-clergy, reassessed our priorities. Um, we can all name things that we did a lot in 2019, um, or at least I think most of us can, that we did a lot in 2019 that we maybe don't do that much anymore. Our priorities have shifted. We've been through kind of a collective trauma. Um, and so kind of who we are has changed. Um, and so people don't come to church out of obligation anymore. Uh, but I think that we're at a point right now that things are shifting. I'm noticing this within my own congregation and I'm, I'm kind of curious whether other congregation leaders are feeling this too. Um, we certainly had some people who have left who haven't come back. Um, some have been still worshiping online and some haven't come back at all. Um, and our small church is seeing new faces on the regular um, at levels that exceed pre-pandemic. Um, I've been at my church for six years and I can say this pretty definitively. Uh, maybe we're unique. Uh, the data we've seen tonight kind of says so, um, but I think that it's sort of broadly true that people are searching for meaning. Um, Allison talked about an openness that congregations have to shifting and new ways of seeing things, and I think that that's probably broadly true of a lot of people outside of churches that maybe they weren't open to religion before, um, but are sort of searching for meaning now. And the people that have stayed um, have stayed because church made the list of things that they really find essential and they had to think about it and they had to think about it hard, um, as you all surely know. 
Um, as Scott also said, we've seen an increased response to need. Um, I think our people have felt more essential and like our work is essential and that's given them a new sense of purpose that simply fed the need for meaning. Um, and so in conclusion, yes, uh, some things in my congregation and I'm sure in yours too, if you attend or lead a congregation have died. Uh, we have seen a lot of death. Um, both of beloved people um, and beloved traditions and programs. Like it just feels like a series of endings and traumas. Um, but in my faith, um, Christian, Lutheran, um, despite death being thrown in our faces, which has always been true, um, but maybe has been more so lately, uh, our faith has an answer to death. My faith has an answer to death. And that is um, the very simple promise that I've found myself saying over and over in sermons, uh, that the worst thing is never the last thing, um, that we are always rising again. Um, each and every day. Um, and so I'm seeing that borne out in a lot of different ways. Uh, and I hope that you are too. Um, and with that, I will turn it back, I believe, to Allison uh, for our Q&A. Thank you both. So I'm going to invite uh, the panelists to turn their, their videos on. And we are thankful for those of you who have already shared your questions. I'll invite you now, if you have not already and you have a question you would like to ask, please use the Q&A feature. Uh, we're not sharing the questions via the chat. So use the Q&A feature uh, to raise your question and then we can answer some of them live here as we have time. Uh, and then we will likely respond also uh, with some text in the chat to some of you. Um, so to start us off, um, we have uh, quite a few great questions. Uh, we have one from Lay who is asking really a question about uh, in-person versus remote worship. And um, she says that in the churches that uh, she pastored during the pandemic, that they've had more online than they've had in person. And is just wondering how that breakdown plays out on the percentages of, of in-person versus online and saying that members tell her that they just prefer to watch from home in their PJs and not rush in and make the kids come out on a family day. Um, so I think as we go through this, if you have a question for a particular panelist, feel free to say that. Otherwise, we can open it up. And I think we'll maybe start this one with Scott, because I know you've done a little bit of analysis on um, some of those differences. And then others of you who might want to chime in some of your insights. Yeah, um, basically what we found is um, <laughs> there's a wide, wide variety. When you, when you talk about hy the hybrid, um, you're, you're gonna find a, a large percentage of hybrid congregations that have vastly more uh, in-person and some with, with more online. Um, however, from, from some of my analysis, it, it was pretty apparent that if a congregation had the vast majority that were online and just in the hybrid, uh, they were not doing as well. But, but actually overall, uh, the congregations that are only worshiping uh, in person or only worshiping online uh, overall are not growing at all. <laughs> only those that are hybrid are growing. Um, but what it looks like from the data is that the, the hybrid, I mean, excuse me, the online versus in-person balance needs to be about 50-50 or at most twice as many in-person that as online, but if it gets more skewed either direction, um, growth doesn't happen as much. And I, I think in part, one of the reasons might be that if, if you get too far to one end or the other, then you forget about uh, the, the other population. <laughs> you're, you're not addressing those folks who are virtual or you're not addressing the face-to-face -face people if, if the balance gets too far out of, out of sync. Um, so that that's kind of what it looked like, uh, but but again, you know, we we are just starting as as Sarah's early graphic shows. We've we've done three surveys so far. We probably have another ten or twelve at least uh, to put together. And as we do that, we'll gather more data and we'll be able to do more discriminant analysis on some of it. Uh, 
but hybridity is the way to go. And, and I think trying to balance um, the both populations is, is probably the best strategy. Anybody else have a comment on that before we go to the next question? Uh, no. Sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. A reflection on that, um, because my church's um, virtual service was on YouTube, we found it very difficult to discern what the actual attendance was. We sometimes, we know people were watching who might have four or five in a family, and we know some people were popping on for 30 seconds and flipping onto something else. We know we had people joining us from Texas and other parts of the world sometime, and that was very exciting, but there were like then how do you engage them within a local congregation? These were questions that we never quite figured out how to grapple with in the local church sense. And um, I don't know how that might even come close to being reflected in your data. <laughs> Hannah, you're gonna add something to Yeah, The only thing I'm gonna add to Scott's comment is that um, I think it'll be really interesting to see as we continue to collect our regional data some of the preliminary things we're seeing is that region matters a lot for whether or not online is still being offered or how much it's being offered. I noticed that the person asking the question led congregations in New Jersey and Virginia. Those are places that we're seeing a lot more online still being offered, whereas the congregations we're seeing in Texas and Indianapolis and others are, are really um, pushing the in-person component a lot more. So mm -hmm. I think too, that's something to think about as we think about the role of remote in terms of its impact on congregations, what other factors are, are affecting mm -hmm. that based on region and mm -hmm. other issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was gonna say, Allison, following up because a couple of questions were, were asking about, uh, about that very thing, uh, mm -hmm. about staying open or opening rapidly. And, and it, was, it was absolutely clear um, that the vast majority did not stay open and uh, they all closed at, at least for, for a brief period of time. The, the congregations that were most likely to not close were, were the smallest congregations um, and probably also very rural. But it, it's, it's also uh, pretty clear that the quicker you opened back up, <laughs> the more likely you are to have grown. <laughs> Uh, but you, but they didn't open up just only to in person. They they opened up usually hybrid. Um, but in a, in a in a, a religious ecology, if if one congregation opened up early, uh, it looks like at least from some of the data, from some of the data in Catholic and also Orthodox, but but also in Evangelical, that that the congregation that opened up first uh, actually gained people. Uh, from some of the other uh, congregations in the area uh, of that same uh, faith tradition. So um, I, I, there is definitely an ad advantage uh, in, in some ways to, to jumping in there first. Mm -hmm. We have some great questions uh, coming in here. Um, one from Don is talking about the cumulative impact of grief. Um, question around what people lost in terms of economic loss, loss of a familiar, predictable world. Um, and he's asking, what are you observing as churches intentional processing or spiritual care of grief? And I think a lot of this is going to come um, out of um, our case studies and the more qualitative work that we're doing with field work. But I'll just share one example. Um, one of the churches that we're studying actually ended up holding a, a grieving circle. Uh, fairly recently, um, just in the last um, about six weeks, um, bringing people together and having a space outside of a regular service or any kind of programming or format uh, for the community to come together and to just hold a space of grief and lament. And so I think we are seeing in some congregations a rise um, and appreciation perhaps for a theology of lament um, to really grapple deeply with how these changes have impacted us at such a deep level. Um, and for, for some congregations, this has been providing these spaces and opportunities to really enact a, a theology of a lament in some ways. And I'll see if anybody else wants to, to add a, a comment to that. 
I know, at least in my congregation, the observation of Holy Week um, kind of will never be the same as it was before. Um, just that sort of journey through the depths of grief and death. Um, and as I shared during our, our a pastoral innovation network of New England gathering, it's I was taught how to teach congregations um, to express lament. Um, but one of the things that I've noticed in my church people is that people are also hungering for joy. And so figuring out how to strike that balance has been fascinating, but, um, yeah. we were actually able to hold our Easter vigil this year and I don't think we've had a more joyful one. Um, so I think the story of, of, at least for us, like our own faith story has kind of helped us to process the grief. Okay. Um, okay. it's like, you know, these things have stuck around for thousands of years for a reason. Um, and I think I've, I've found that really useful. We also have quite a few questions asking about the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on African-American communities, uh, on Latino communities, and kind of asking about what is our research, how, how are we engaging in the disparities and the, the differences and how the pandemic may have impacted black or brown congregations as to, compared to primarily white congregations. So I know that we're, we're really at the early stages of doing that kind of analysis, but I think it's a very important question and um, it's worth um, exploring as deeply as we can. Scott or Hannah, do you want to add any thoughts to that? Um, I, I had um, typed a, a response to a, to a similar question. Um, you know, our, our, represent, our, our survey responses uh, for congregations of color has, has been less than stellar. And, and that's why we're trying to connect with some other networks uh, in order to oversample uh, the, some of those congregations. But, but it was, uh, it's pretty clear so far that um, African-American congregations do look uh, significantly different. They, they're still less likely to be back uh, worshiping in person. Uh, they have had, I think, a little bit harder time having people participate to the level that they were participating before. They were also much, much more likely to um, open up their building uh, to both, both to the larger community, but, but also uh, to um, have testing and vaccination clinics. Uh, in fact, almost the entire population of congregations that said they opened up uh, were, were African-American congregations. So I, I think there there are going to be uh, some real significant differences, but we we need uh, a, a little bit larger sample for sure. Mm -hmm. There are some also some interesting questions about the impact on clergy uh, in terms of burnout. Uh, we have a question about how do pastors respond to the exhaustion of, as we've noted, the loss of a volunteer base, a quite dramatic drop in the volunteer base. Um, and also questions just about more broadly how this impacts um, pastors in terms of, you know, their, you know, career plans, if they're retired, thinking about retirement or, or bivocational or the like. I think this is an important question to engage right now because a lot of denominational leaders and pastors are asking themselves these questions. Scott, do you want to share a few thoughts? <laughs> sure. Uh, re read my RNS article. <laughs> no. um, the, you know, it, 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 was, it was very clear that, um, that you know, we, we ask a question, um, was, uh, 2020, the hardest uh, ministry year ever. And, uh, you know, a, a significant uh, percentage of, of congregations, 67% uh, of, of pastors said uh, that they had thought that at least once. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but we also we also asked them um, had they thought seriously about considering to leave the ministry, and uh, you may have seen that Varna Research also asked that question and was claiming that 38 percent of clergy were thinking of leaving the ministry. Well, we found 37 percent had thought that at some point in 2020, but. We also asked, how often did you think it? Did, did, was it once or twice, a few times, fairly often or very often? And when you start to look at how many, what percentage of pastors thought it very often, it was only 3%. <laughs> and, and that same, or roughly that same 3% also said they doubted uh, their call. <laughs> and they also said they were considering leaving their current congregation. And if you looked at those, it, it was almost all the same people uh, that were thinking that. And if you look at where they were, they were already in um, challenging situations. So it wasn't just the pandemic. It was that they were in, in a smaller congregation that was struggling uh, to, to exist, that had conflict. <laughs> and, and, and so it was the whole context and everything that they were in. It wasn't just the pandemic. But, but it, it, it is pretty clear that what we're hearing from clergy is uh, the, the stress, uh, you know, essentially what we're, what's happening right now is the pandemic was the hurricane or the tornado, right? And we're just now coming out of the basement or, or coming down from the attic uh, during this traumatic reality. And then open the door and look and see the devastation that's there, right? The work is just now beginning. Before, there was a reaction to this traumatic event, right? We, we all had to, to do what we had to do. But, but now the real work happens of putting things back together, um, of learning how to be the church in a, in a different reality. And what we have are... Uh, many, many stressed, exhausted pastors who, who are realizing they have fewer they, they have fewer volunteers and they have this large work of trying to reinvent what uh, congregational life is going to look like in, in a new reality uh, and hopefully not just go back to the old patterns of, and behavior. So, I, I think it is it is going to be uh, a challenging time in the next few years. Whether all these pastors are going to to resign, I, I think is probably unlikely. But but um, many of them are going to get exhausted for sure. So okay. we have to we have to give all the love we can to clergy. Anna, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, can I jump in with a a sideways idea and some like. I think in order to understand how we come out of this as clergy, we need to start un unpacking how all of the community building wound up on clergy shoulders during the pandemic. Um, because it, it wound up being the pastors making the phone calls to check in on each other. And as much as we might encourage and give lip service to reach out to your friends and neighbors, reach out to the people you're missing at church, people didn't follow through on this. <laughs> um, so I think it'd be kind of, it'd be interesting, not something you do in a large survey like you do, but to, to go in and find out what was it that was feeding this disconnect? Why did volunteers not want to call their neighbor? Um, mm -hmm. And I think if we could understand that, we might understand a bit about how this happened. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, also, I, I will own up to the fact that I took uh, Scott's survey and uh, I was the 3%. <laughs> um, I did think about uh, quitting uh, often. Um, I found it hard to believe that that was only 3%. <laughs> Um, because it was really stinking hard. Um, I'm actually really glad you can't see my notes because I used a different adjective um, before hard um, <laughs> adverb. Um, I realized that the way that we do ministry to Rachel's point was completely unsustainable. Um, but that also a lot of things that I thought I was obligated to do, I actually wasn't. 
um, that I had a lot of flexibility and that a lot of the things I thought I was obligated to do actually weren't that useful um, to my congregation. Um, like I was sort of fed this, um, I must sit at my desk for eight hours a day or else be doing something else sort of trackable, um, which is sort of silly um, in the grand scheme of things um, and was quickly leading me to burnout. Um, so I basically just rethought everything and realized that as clergy, I had the privilege to do that, especially as solo clergy. Um, uh, I have uh, two bosses, my church council and Jesus, um, and they've both been incredibly gracious uh, through all of this. Um, and so I realized, I reassessed my own call and sort of in very secular terms, my own job um, and realized that I feel useful. I have tons of flexibility in my work um, and that my expertise is useful. So that allowed me to think about what is essential, what is helpful, what does it mean to have boundaries? Um, and one thing that I say all of the time whenever I can is if I could rend recommend one book uh, to my clergy friends, it is Nedra Tawab's Set Boundaries, Find Peace. Um, it is not a book for clergy, it is a book for human beings, and I will drop it into the chat um, about what it means to set boundaries, to state boundaries, and to be very clear, because that, along with um, my colleagues both at the Pastoral Innovation Network of New England and my colleagues in the New England Senate of the ELCA have kind of saved my career and helped me to realize that, yeah, I, I do love what I do. Um, mm -hmm. Felt a renewed sense of call. Mm -hmm. We have a question here from Kevin, who's wondering about the dramatic dip in attendance at Catholic and Orthodox churches in particular. Um, what are our thoughts on this? I, I haven't looked at that uh, particularly, although uh, perhaps uh, Hannah, Hannah can reference it, but uh, yeah. my, my guess would be that it was because the Catholic and Orthodox churches didn't do that much online because on, online worship doesn't really work for an embodied uh, liturgical uh, form. And, and therefore you saw that immediate drop but then you see you see them bounce back up because they did open up uh, in person uh, more rapidly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Scott Scott's comment is exactly it. I mean, Catholic and Orthodox churches believe, theologically speaking, in a in the the body of Christ being physically present in communion. So, um, to to try and to participate in these really important liturgical events in those traditions over Zoom is just not going to be considered like a real theological event. Um, and so there's a completely different orientation towards Zoom and online that exists in those traditions as opposed to evangelical traditions and other mainline traditions. So, um, so with the Catholic and Orthodox, you see a different effect as a result of, I think, a theological belief about the function and purpose of, of liturgical gatherings. Um, and similar you know, to what Scott said is that those, those numbers dip more, more strongly during the middle of the pandemic, but at the point that we are now, those numbers have come back up considerably um, to, compared to the mainline tradition, which I think has really struggled a lot to bring those numbers back up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, thinking about a, a question for, for all of us as we've reflected on um, the data that we've seen and discussed this evening and thinking about your, your experiences in ministry, um, Anna and Rachel, what, would, what did you find sort of most surprising uh, out of this data that we've uncovered thus far on the impact of the pandemic on congregations? Andrew, we haven't heard too much from you, so I want to give you a chance also to to think about this one. Sure, I, yeah, I, I'd be happy to share. I think the data that most shocked me was, uh, uh, I think we've brought this up, the number of churches that just stopped fellowship events. Uh, so I think it was upwards mm -hmm. of 50 some percent that stopped fellowship events. And, you know, uh, echoing what, um, what my colleagues have said tonight, you know, it, in some ways, 
it, it seems like in stopping fellowship events, church just became a chore and a task for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, that there was no time to just simply be that every church event, there was something to be doing, something to be done, a task that had to, to get checked off. Uh, whereas fellowship events are, are oftentimes a, a, an event that sure there's planning involved, but once it goes, it goes, um, that you're there to be with people and to be together. And that those, those really just stopped during the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that was most surprising for me. Mm -hmm. I'll let others share. I think the biggest shock to me was the the vastly different reaction to giving during the pandemic of some congregations. Some congregations seem to embrace that they really missed and valued church and they wanted to fund it. Um, I know I spoke to two or three congregations um, during those two years that had increases in tithes and offerings during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and on the flip side, there were many that it just, it trailed off. They, you know, that they, they would argue that if you're not passing the plate, you're not, you're not, you're not going to get my dollars. <laughs> um, so, um, it, so to hear now that, that they're kind of stabilizing and back to where they were, or at least close to where they were, um, it, it's a relief, but mm -hmm. I, I do wonder why the difference is. Mm -hmm. We just have a couple more minutes. If anyone else wants to think about what they found most surprising. To speak to Rachel's comment, I found it really surprising that overall, like, like across traditions, financial giving and tithing was fairly stable in our data. Um, with some with some fluctuations for sure, but um, overall, I was surprised to see that that many many congregations reported um, that that giving had not decreased, even though volunteering had decreased so significantly in these other things. So, I thought that was very interesting, and I'm intrigued to see how that continues to evolve over time and what will happen with volunteering and if volunteering increases will giving decrease and some of these other other things that right now haven't are yet to happen mm -hmm. one one of the other interesting things um, uh, about giving uh, in, our, in our previous uh, faith communities today surveys in 2010 and 2015 uh, I I did analysis and found that if if a congregation had any online giving, uh, per capita giving went up almost almost $100 a person <laughs> if they just had it. <laughs> and if they emphasized it while having uh, online giving, if they, if they called it out and you know, tried to get people in, the per capita giving went up about $300. <laughs> uh, so if you think about how many congregations have shifted uh, from you know, plate offering to, or to some form of mm -hmm. online giving, uh, it doesn't surprise me too. It didn't. Well, I mean, it, it was a little bit surprising that it that it rose so much. But but uh, it, it makes sense that that mm -hmm. in some sense, uh, even if we hadn't had a pandemic, and and people had taken my word over the last ten years to do that, uh, they would have gotten more money anyway. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think I think there is there is something there. But it, it mm -hmm. it's going to be interesting to watch because. Now those folks are not going to turn off their online giving, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe we're going to see uh, fewer mm -hmm. people, but still sustain a higher level of sustained giving per capita. Yeah. So uh, it could be interesting. Well, these have been great questions. Thank you all. And I'm going to turn it over to Sarah for uh, closing comments. Thank you, Allison, and thank you um, to all of our participants who have attended and asked such great questions here. Um, I would like to just mention a few resources before we close, um, things that you can check out and learn more about our research through. The first um, and possibly most um, prominent would be our uh, project website at covidreligionresearch.org. And while you're there, we especially encourage you to check out our resource library of other studies, um, in addition to our own that have been conducted on the topic of the pandemic and religion. 
um, and some related publications that have emerged. Um, also our timeline feature that offers an interactive chronological walkthrough of congregations in the time of COVID um, spanning from January 2020 to present. And our blog, which publishes frequent stories that shine a light on the uh, unique experiences and creative adaptations of a number of individual congregations. Um, and while you're on our website, we also invite you to sign up for our project newsletter. Um, I know uh, Susan, our communications director for the university, mentioned the newsletter of the uh, of HIU as well, which we also encourage you to sign up for, but we do have a project specific newsletter that has uh, details on our research coming out of this study as well. Um, and you can find that either in the footer of our website um, or sign up directly by visiting bit.ly slash epic newsletter. And uh, we also encourage you to follow along with our project on social media via Facebook or Twitter. And uh, for ease of access, um, those links will probably be in the chat and we'll also send a follow up email to this presentation that contains all of the links mentioned as well. Um, and there are also a number of ways that you can get involved with our project, depending on um, where you're coming from. So if you represent a congregation or a denomination that's not already involved, um, we invite you to consider joining our longitudinal panel study or participating in our annual topical key informant surveys. Um, so you can actually sign up directly via our website um, to express interest in either one of those aspects or both, um, and do so by clicking on congregational and denominational leaders under the get involved dropdown. And if you happen to be a researcher that has produced um, any research about the religion about religion during the pandemic, we invite you to share it with us um, and potentially be featured on our website in that way. And again, you can find uh, more information about that on our website by clicking on researchers under the Get Involved dropdown. And we'll bring the event to a close at this time. And again, we'll follow up with an email that contains many of the links and resources and reports mentioned throughout. And uh, thank you again, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. <laughs>